<laughs> How was it, man? Yeah, like good. It? Yeah. Very chill. Yeah, right. chill. You know, I try to keep it like easy. Um, yeah, when when we first came up with Behind the Billboard, we were going to record it always in the upstairs of a pub. So it was like over ah, a pint nice, talking nice. about the same thing. Oh, I like it. I, it's the, yeah, and I try, you know, of course, we don't drink good. much. It's more like for the vibe. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey Dan, thank you for accepting the invite and welcome to A Glass of Marketing with Joe. The concept is pretty simple. We usually drink a glass of wine while we talk about marketing, of course, personal and professional growth. Thank you very much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. On Worries, man. Day. Thank you for accepting the invite. And today we're going to drink a bottle of Ferrari, which is our sponsor, by the way. Uh, Ferrari is like the Italian champagne. They also sponsor the FA1, so this is actually the wine that they, they pop when You're not going to spray me with it then? No, no worries, man. No worries. <laughs> we didn't win yet. We didn't win yet. <laughs> Maybe by the end. But yeah, so this is 100% Chardonnay, amazing wine. And this is actually the limited edition. So they do a wine for every truck of the FA1. And this is actually the Monza one. So the, okay. Italian, the Italian truck. Cheers, and thank you for accepting the invite. Cheers. It's good. It's good, right? It's good. So, Dan, uh, for people who don't know you, you are the chief creative officer of Grand Visual, part of Talon. Can you better explain what you guys do and what's your role? Yeah. Um, so, Talon, as a group, we're um, an out-of-home specialist looking at planning, buying against audiences around the world. Um, and Grand Visual is the creative arm of Talon. So, I found a Grand Visual co-founder Grand Visual in 2005, and it was acquired by Talon in 2019. I look after everything creative, so I've got an amazing team doing uh, all the creativity, we've got tech team, production team, all being brought to life, headquartered out of London, um, but we deliver projects to 75 markets around the world. How so. did you guys start? So 2005. 2005. Long time. So. Yeah, it was, it was, and we primarily started to work in the digital out of home space because we could see the world transforming from paper to pixel. Um, so we looked at, you know, there, were, there was no one really out there focusing on digital out of home production. So we thought we carved ourselves a little, nice little niche there. And it was to help agencies and brands overcome the fact that these things were popping up on the wall that no one knew how to produce for, or, com or the, the, the methods or techniques of communication. For. So do you install the, the technology as well? Or? No, we, we, the media owners, the, the great media owners all around the world, the Clear Channels and JC Decos of the world, um, Ocean Outdoor, I mean, like, the list goes on. In the US, we work with Lamar and Outfront and, um, and the, the big global operators for, for out of home. They put in lots of technology themselves, the screens, they work on all the back end. We think about how um, a brand or advertiser or agency might like to use it across the board. So that may be using three or four different media owners and what could we do to change the way they communicate. So a good example of that would be we might use data in some way to update the creative as it's going on through its campaign cycle. So in simple terms, that could be you know, the weather here is pretty nice all year round, but where it fluctuates in London, as you know, um, or in the US, how might we change our message according to the mindset of a consumer? So. When it's sunny, everyone's happy. When it's rainy, maybe they're not so happy. So how can we change the message as people are going around the city um, based on what's happening in real time? That's, that's one of the that's interesting. Yeah. So you take care of more like of the creative production. Absolutely. And placement. Yeah. So we work with creative agencies and brands. They, have, they may have an idea, they may not have an idea, but we help them bring it to life on screen and for out of home audiences. So it kind of just, we're looking at ways to just elevate what could be wallpaper and turn it into something that's a bit more of a digestible you know experience for people sometimes so interactivity is one of those yeah things. no and, and i think it's great because you can change the message as well Correct. as you said every time where probably the traditional 
uh, billboard was like always on, the message was there, you couldn't change it every 10 minutes. Where today with billboards, you can also like change the, the brand and the message, right? Correct. And that the, is the world's oldest medium, right? Yeah. Paint, painted walls, they'll stay painted for a long time. Whereas as digitization has started to happen, we can update things in real time or over the course of a campaign life cycle. What can you measure today? What you can't measure yet? In terms of measurement? Yes. Um, so there are lots of great effectiveness studies. We, In terms of the measurement on the creative side, it's quite interesting. We have a brand, um, let's say Google have been an advertiser with us. They may have 20,000 different messages that could be potentially displayed. So for measurement for us, we know what played, where it played, how long it played for, and we can report that back to Google. And then Google on their own side will say, actually, I know the exposure because of the mobile devices and this is what the, how the message was delivered. And they can translate that back to a, a kind of a, more of a performance marketing play for out of home. And that's not been, you know, that's there's something that out of home is, has only really just got from digitization. Couldn't really do that with standard billboards and, and static. Now we can do that with digital. We can really start to delve down on how a campaign has performed based on what was played and where it was played. And then there are all the usual metrics of did it make the tills ring in the shop or, uh, or were people exposed? You know, it's the, it's the yeah, because you can measure like frequency and the area of exposure, right? Absolutely. And lots of brands are doing this A-B testing, city versus city as well. So there's, there's, some, there's some great stuff happening. And the digitization of out of home has helped all of that. And I think the, the medium has grown up because of digitization, which is exactly why we formed the company in 2005. Can you do attribution yet? So for example, if people see the billboards and then they go to the shop and buy, you can't really attribute it yet, right? There are, there are some techniques that we use. I'll give you a good example yeah. of a campaign that we delivered in the US, um, work with a whiskey brand. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and they were, um, they sponsored a local hockey team mm -hmm. in Colorado, in Denver. And we created a dynamic campaign that was reactive to the scores of the hockey game. So when people came out of the, the, um, the arena, they saw the billboards and the street furniture. So there's kind of the, the um, stuff as you walk past around the city. And because the team had won, it was a kind of celebration message with a QR code on there. And it said, go have a drink on us. So they could go to any bar, they could order a drink. With the QR code, they could take a photo of their receipt and then they get the money back from the brand because they're celebrating the win from the team. So that has a very real attribution level because we can see how many people scan the QR code, how many people got their money back and you get to that, that full exposure there. So it's just a way of how do, we, how do we engage with a consumer using a poster and then how do we deliver a benefit back to them? So there are real ways to do attribution. Um, you don't get, it's not as simple as the click through stuff that we're going to see online, but it's, you know, there are ways to do it and techniques that we use to, to kind of engage people and reward them for engaging. And probably with technology evolving over time, you're going to have more advanced technique as well. Right? Absolutely. As, uh, with the exposure with mobile devices sitting in our pockets, we're going to understand all of that. So, yeah. Um, but the, yeah, there are other things that we can do as well within outdoor to interact with people and, and kind of deliver on attribution if that's what people are after. Outdoor is still used as a broadcast medium. It's still, yeah. The yeah. cover and frequency is still there for outdoor. Yeah, because I think the challenge with today's media is that in the past, you couldn't measure anything. Today, you can measure a lot, right? And now, of course, you know, CMOs have power because, of course, now they can sit down and talk about return on investment, right? But I think we also obsess on measurement today because, okay, measuring is important, but measuring too much or even measuring the wrong thing is even worse, right? So I think we need also to find the right balance between measuring, but then also doing things properly and trusting the process, right? I'll give you a good example of this. We did something with Disney Parks. We've worked with them for a while. We delivered something in a shopping mall that was probably seen by only, must be maybe 5,000 people over the course of a weekend. It was a stunt, right? So if you're looking at the attribution model for the 5,000 people and the amount of money they spent, they go, a CMO would look at that and go, I'm not doing that because the, the cost of that exposure per person is way too high. However, we filmed the event, we cut down a video that went on their social and it was seen by 350 million people online. 
And they, so actually then the CMO says, ha, huh, now you've given, you've produced a stunt, you've done something out of home for real people, you've produced a video and it's got exposure to a much wider pool of people. I'm going to sign that off because now the, the cost per thousand is brilliant. I will sign that off. So there are techniques that we use like that where you say, it's not just that one event, it's what you can do with the content that that event creates to deliver some more attribution for you. How do you create a content based on the billboard then? So if it were, so this one for Disney, um, I'll send it to you so you can see it, was a shadow play. So people stand in front of a screen and the shadow, the Disney shadow, they were casting a Disney shadow and they were doing the same thing. So there was action and emotion there between consumer oh, okay. and brand. So we did hidden camera shoot. So, so people were playing with this thing and it becomes a real people hidden camera shoot and turns into an edit and then that is a nice brand story to say. I that. think it then is the power of experience, right? Because when you interact with something like a billboard, because it's easier to interact and have more people interacting with something physical, right? Absolutely. They're not like a, a mobile <coughs> ad, right? So and I think- I, That's the power of emotion. Uh, for, for us in the, um, in the outdoor world, we're dealing with real people and we're very aware that we're not invited into their lives. We, we are, we, you know, we're, we're displayed in a, in a public space. So we have to do something that rewards them for engaging. So, and that could be emotion. That could be as simple as the value exchange between a consumer and the brand is, I'm going to make you laugh. There's humor. Uh, it may be, I want you to do something. I want you to donate to this charity. I want you to change the, your behavior. But... The communication between brand and consumer has to be mindful of the situation, the mindset, what someone's doing, because they are going to work or they are on their weekend, they're spending time with their family and you're asking them to engage with a brand in their life, in their world. So for us, it's about how do we do that and are we doing it for the right reason? And then what is the value exchange for them actually interacting? Yeah, and I think it's also the power of gamification, right? I've seen some billboards in London where you can, could actually interact. So mm -hmm. you, you could uh, walk through and something was moving, you know? So then uh, you also have the kind of the opportunity to share it online as well. So you might interact with the play. Maybe you will go your kid or your girlfriend playing with it. You take a picture and then it goes online as well. So you might also have like, you know. The wider, the wider pull of content. I'll give you a good example of that. Um, Pepsi, one of our clients in the UK. We've just done something about, they sponsored the Champions League final. It was in mm -hmm. London this year. We did something underneath the Piccadilly Circus screen biggest screen in Europe obviously it's amazing it's the, the most iconic location mm -hmm. for our home we did a photo play underneath the Piccadilly lights where people could have their picture taken with one of the Pepsi PepsiCo brands taking eating, uh, chips have their picture taken and it goes up onto the big screen now that what that does is it creates content for people right so we take a picture exactly. of that we give it back to them on email they share that online and all of a sudden we're co-creating content that sits on their Instagram and it's all branded but it's at heart, it's an out-of-home idea. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think this is also the power of out-of-home. It's like you can actually share online. Like you, going back to murals, for example, like in London, they do a lot of like in East London, mainly, they do a lot of murals for brands. And a lot of people take pictures because at the end of the day, this is art, right? Uh -huh. And I love when, you know, like advertising, marketing and street art and art in general get together, right? Because I think, I mean, at the end of the day, a lot of artists got a budget from advertising to express yeah. themselves. So I love when <coughs> advertisement can be art as well. And I think Can Lions, today we're recording live from Canada. It's also part of that, right? And I think, you know, with murals in particular, it's about the process. People are interested in the process. You know, um, I used to do graffiti. Oh, really? So, yeah, yeah. So this oh, is why I love well, it as well. So you must meet um, the Global Street Art team as well. They're, we okay. do lots of work with them and okay. Mural Republic in, in the UK. I'll introduce you to them. They're, they're yeah. really good. They, they talk you through the technique of how they do it. These massive amazing, walls, you know, the, the size of this wall. And so for, for a street artist, it's a great opportunity to work with a brand and paint a wall. And the technique they use is really interesting. So the ad is not just the wall. It's actually for the piece process. of content. They want to, you know, so we video the process, we take that out and it goes out on the brand's channel. So um, the, the process of advertising, the production of the advertising really works. So for them, that's a, you know, it's a win because they get a big wall, everyone sees it, but they also get a piece of content for their, for their marketing as well. 
Yeah, and on the other side, like getting back to Piccadilly Circus, I've seen some ads where they, they are actually 3D, so they get out of it. How do you do that? Like, So this is um, a technique called anamorphic creative. Okay. There, there was confusion when this stuff started. It's pretty big in Japan, right? It is, and in Korea Japan. as well. Yeah. There was, there was a lot of confusion in the industry when this started to come out of this technique because people assumed that it was a new technology. This is like, a, oh, wow, I need to use this 3D technology. Is this billboard 3D enabled? You know, the, all of this stuff. And it's quite similar to the technique, you know, when you watch a football game and they paint on the grass at an angle for the TV camera yeah. to make it look like there's something standing up. It's the same process. Anamorphic street art uses the same yeah, process. Yeah. You stand, you take a photo from a particular angle and it looks like something different. It's exactly the same. So um, from a, from a, for a curved screen perspective, it looks great from this one position. So I film it, I get it online, I use that for social content. Okay. But from a different angle, it looks very strange. So it's a technique that forces the perspective of the viewer and it appears 3D. And there's a couple of techniques you'd use to break that 3D moment. So you create a border and then you break the border and it makes it look like it's popping out. So lots of great examples, again, on Piccadilly Circus of this because it's a nice curved screen. Oh, exciting. But we do stuff on flat screens as well. So we've done something recently for PepsiCo again, where the can looks like it's popping out of the ad. Um, and again, it's just a different way to kind of break out of the border of a traditional ad. No, it's cool. I was attention. in Tokyo the other, the other <clears> year. <throat> yeah, I was in Tokyo last year. It was actually pretty cool to see some ads. They were like actually coming out, but like, they were also interacting at some point. Like one ad was interacting with the other ad. It was like, wow. And a lot of people stopped by just to take pictures, right? We've just delivered something for Etihad in New York where they had two massive billboards either side of 8th Avenue. Incredible, massive billboards. And we produced an, um, an anamorphic piece that went from one screen to the other. And so you could see content flying between the ads. And <laughs> the amount of people that stop and just, oh my God, <laughs> this is amazing. It's the future. And it's, you know, it's, again, it's a technique, not a technology, but a few. Yeah, no, and, and right this technique. is the beauty of advertising, right? When you actually grab attention and you yeah. entertain people as well, right? Because not just about delivering the messages. Uh, Grabbing the attention and, and entertaining is one of the key to do that, right? Uh, we're really lucky to work, as I think, this, with this canvas because it is highly public, it's visible, it's, and it's newsworthy. How many ads use billboards in their TV ads because they know it's in the real world? You know, we're, we're lucky to have the canvas that we do um, and to produce ads that turn heads and that end up coming back to us, like, oh, have you seen this? I mean, yeah, we, we saw that, we did that. And this. So how do you see the future of out of home advertising then? I think digitization will continue to happen. Mm -hmm. I think we're coming toward, in the UK, for sure, we're coming towards a tipping point. Um, across Europe and across the US, it, it will continue to, to digitize more, I think. Um, I think as technology is better, more interactivity will happen. So we'll see more and more mobile to billboard control. Mm -hmm. So huh. how do we personalize ads for people? I don't think we'll get to that point of, you know, one-to-one -one advertising on billboards, but being able to personalize things quicker based on who's there is definitely the... the but you mean like way. by the cluster? So like yeah. a group of people, if there is like, I don't know, in the subway, there are in that specific moment, 70% males, then you're gonna, do it more like around and We do a bit of that already with our dynamic stuff, so uh -huh. with our open products. So we're doing stuff around around the city when um, a football game is on. This is a great example. On a Saturday or a Sunday in London, there's five or six Premier League teams, fans moving around the city. We change the messages based on what's happening. So if you're a, a gaming company or a, if you're a sports company and you want to tap into the current culture of a city, Sports is an easy thing to do and you kind of, you know, you can change your messaging based on the fans and how they're moving around. And we've done that with commuters as well. You know, we do that when we know there are train delays, we can change the messages on the boards at train stations. Being more mindful of what people are going through. Do you think you attribution is going to improve or because of privacy and other you know, things? I, I think it's difficult. For us in the creative world, um, we talk about it a lot because we want to engage with people and we want to... We want to prove that people are engaging with the ads. Um, I think as the there's there's lots of work being done on the kind of verification of digital out of home in particular, and then there's also some work, lots of work being done on how 
effective the ad is in terms of its design and the communication methodology. So some of the tools that are coming to market will say, and they use a bit of AI as well, is how legible is this copy? Is it suitable for the environment? You know, oh. Is it played in the right way? And I think that's what's going to move the dial for, for the creative world. So for, for an agency being able to say, actually, I'm going to run this through this system and should it flag anything to me that I need to do differently because of the environment, because of the other advertisers because of what people are going through. You know, I think it's a, a good way to move our creative um, out home. Do you think, I mean, I usually believe that if in the near future we use glasses, maybe the billboards will be, the, like, they can actually be one-to-one. -one. They can actually change based on, on the people watching. Yeah, again, going back to football, they do this with the perimeter boards, right? So um, the FA Premier League perimeter boards in the UK when we watch TV, we're going to see the, we're going to see the UK advertisers. Really, but in other countries, they could see different advertisers. I didn't so, know that. Yeah, yeah. There's a technology. So it's like green screen. Yeah, What's exactly, that? exactly. And they can replace the perimeter boards from the main camera perspective, so it would look different for the TV advertisers. So they're already doing it. Yeah, and will that happen in out of home for um, billboards? I don't think so. I can't see that. Um, and I, I'm not a fan of like heavily personalized ads. Okay. I don't want, I, again, I go back to that responsibility that we have for being a public advertising space. It's like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna shout too hard, but I am going to change your, I'm gonna try and grab some attention. And I, I just think advertisers need to be more mindful of the, um, of what people are going through. So that means, you know, like the weather or the, or traffic or something different, it's, something's affecting me. So, I should change the way I talk to people, and I think that's uh, that's just being a mindful brand, and I think that's important. For yeah, and no, it's also the responsibility of yeah. not uh, polarizing the uh, information as well, right? Because, like, I think I was talking the other day with someone. Uh, I think probably one of the challenges of media in general today is that, of course, the algorithm want you to spend more time on the platform, right? Yeah. So, of course, they have to show you what you agree on and what you like. And the problem is that we're getting in a society where if you are left, you just see things around the left side and right, only extreme right. So, and I think we need to have conversations and you need to see and watch things you agree on and things you don't agree on and have conversation, right? And uh, otherwise we polarize and, uh, you know, then we get in conflict because, you know, we don't... And you know what's, what's great about the role that we play, and as I've got my podcast as well, Behind the Billboard, we get to meet a lot of people across the industry who represent loads of different brands, loads of different agencies. Um, so being able to see all that work, like whether it's political advertising, whether it's something to do with uh, newspaper advertising, and see all the work and how all the brands communicate for Out of Home is great because it's a patchwork quilt of all the different um, brands when like you said when you're sitting on a device and it learns what you like and what you don't like it will serve up more of what you like yeah and less of what you don't like and I think it's important to open your eyes to the stuff that you don't like as well because that's how we learn as humans right yeah um, and outdoor does that because there are brands out there that are advertising that are not targeted at me but I appreciate their advertising something one at, um, here last night at that in outdoor um, won the Grand Prix, which I think is a really, really, really great campaign. It's not targeted at me. It was down in um, New Zealand. I think it was uh, out of the Auckland team. But it used digital out of home in the right way. It was for stray dogs and for getting people to, to, um, to adopt a dog. And it used technology in a way to serve up those ads in communities that might be more appreciative of, of no. adopting a dog. And, you know, this is using the medium in the right way for people, for a cause-led marketing piece. And it was phenomenal. It did all, it ticked all of the boxes. Now for me, I'm not a dog owner, I don't live down there, but I can appreciate that that is a great ad for a brand who wanted to, 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 to do something for, for the good yeah. pet loving community, so. And so. you mentioned like different industries. In your opinion, what's the hardest industry in terms of like advertising? For out of home? Out of home, but like in general, because I feel like the political uh, industry, I think, 
it's pretty interesting and challenging as well because you're selling ideas, right? <laughs> I, yeah, I actually, I've talked to a couple of people recently on, on my Behind the Billboard podcast who work in pharmaceutical advertising. And I think that's really hard okay. because I think certainly in the US, it's quite formulaic. You know, it's like you have this problem, we have the solution. And then, you know, they tell you all the benefits of taking a certain drug or, or, or treating your yeah. ailment in a certain way. Um, and it's, if you look at most pharmaceutical advertising, it's formulaic. It's the picture of someone who's now living a happy life because of taking this, this drug. They're probably um, more B2B, right? Because they target the doctors and you trust the doctor. Well, no, right? that's what it's like in Europe. But in the US, you're targeting the consumer because okay. you, can, you can ask for these drugs by name from your doctor. So we're used to, in Europe, we're used to the drug going through the NHS system or the, or the, the local healthcare system. And then you've got a problem, the doctor will prescribe a drug. You don't know what brand name it is or where it's come from. In the US, it's very different. So I think having done a, a bit of work in pharmaceutical, I think that's the hardest industry. Because it's trust, pharmacy. right? Yeah, you need yeah. to gain trust and it's the hardest to get, right? And it's also, you have, to, you, as every single creative wants to break the norm, right? I want to do something different, but then you end up working for a brand who said, no, no, this, here's the formula, you know, happy person, <laughs> drug, this is, it. this is the outcome and this is, it. here's all the risks. Um, so I think that's the hardest. I think it's also, you know, there are still there are restrictions in place for out of home advertising yeah. where you can advertise certain things. So on the tube, for example, no high fat, sugar, salt content. Okay, I didn't know. Yeah, okay. so you're not allowed to put that stuff on the tube. So you can't advertise the sugary drink. So the the brands will put their sugar free option on, in that okay. area. Okay. Um, for alcohol brands, not near schools. You know, there's the, there's lots of restrictions in place. So I think it's different in every market, and those rules are there, but. There are, there are those restrictions you have to be aware of. And when you're working out of home, there are even more restrictions in place. I mean, as an Italian, right? And I moved to London now seven years ago. I've noticed how big and developed is the out of home industry in the UK, for example, because as a marketing student, as a marketing passionate, when I uh, walk around London and I go in the tube, like I actually enjoy, you know, the ads. So looking at Europe, after the UK, what other markets are, are pretty big? Because I feel like Italy is not there yet, right? What other markets? It, Italy's not so digitized, but there are some great digital opportunities in, in Italy. Um, France is less digitized. Germany, amazing. Okay. Spain, amazing. Um, so lots of the ads that we do go out to the major cities across Europe. So we talked about anamorphic. We did something for the Wonka release in mm -hmm. December where he lifted off his hat and he all the chocolates came out of the hat and it appeared in 3D. We delivered that to 17 markets around the world. So lots of different billboards, shapes, sizes, big, small. And then and six of those cities were in Europe. So it just shows you the scale yeah. that, that you can have as an advertiser now internationally. Um, but the most developed markets, the Nordics, the Nordics. For, for, for digital, um, Germany, France in the main cities, um, and, the, and Spain, main cities, they're, they're good. And then, of course, the US and Asia, they, they're huge, well, the, right? I mean, the US is huge. The US is 10 times the size of the UK market in terms of volume. Um, I mean, it's 50 times the size. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not yeah, surprising. Yeah. But um, it, again, very different environments. So the urban environments where you've got subways and, um, and street advertising, where you've got pedestrian traffic. But for the most part, lots of different uh, roadside billboards and digital roadside billboards. So the ability to do that for driving traffic as, they, as, as people drive around. So Dan, usually during this podcast, we start talking about marketing and professional growth, but then we move into the personal growth. Right? Okay. So the, the usual topic I want to uh, go through is how do you find your work-life balance? Because I guess uh, you must be very busy, right? So many billboards to take care of, right? Yeah. So how do you find your work-life balance, you know, if there is any? Of you course. know, there's, yeah, <laughs> they're, they're, you have to, right? <laughs> and we mentioned off air, um, I always find that it's about oxygen, like finding the right oxygen in the right part of your life. Keep the fire burning, right? I have three kids. That provides a lot of oxygen. An um, 11-year-old, a 10-year-old, and a 3-year-old. Um, the 3-year-old provides a lot more <laughs> oxygen than the older two now. Um, but, you know, 
being able to switch, turn off the laptop. Okay, football practice. You know, it's like I coach the two soccer teams that they're in. Oh, nice. The team. So it's like those things, like being outdoors, doing stuff, being active. We live. Being got a a outdoor as well. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. Without billboards, yeah. We live not right next to a forest, so we go walking in the forest. There's no billboards in the forest, which is good. Um, yeah, being away from it, it gives you more reason to want to go back to it. Um, and the other thing I had, so I mentioned my podcast, that provides me with a lot of creative oxygen as well. I get to meet people like Rich Denny and Sir John Hegarty and Nils Leonard. They come in, we talk about the work, we talk about about billboard advertising, but about the creative process. And for me, that and for my my pod partner, Hugh, it provides great oxygen for us to go, oh, we're meeting new people. We're not talking about our own work. We're not trying to sell something to a client. We're hearing about someone else's process. And I think that's, you know, I think that's just part of being a human and listening and, and appreciating other people. Yeah, I think it's also about keeping your passion, right? So for example, same thing for me, right? I launched this uh, video podcast because I wanted to uh, investigate more, study, meet new people. And it's all, I think, when in our daily routine, we always end up doing the same things, right? Yeah. And you might end up losing your passion, losing your energy. Uh, so you, you need oxygen, as you said, right? So probably doing different things. Like for me, it's like education, so like university, these podcasts. But then, of course, like doing other things not related to work, like yeah. traveling, having your own passion. Like my other passion is wine. So, of course, going out, uh, meeting friends with the same passion and, I don't know, drinking a new bottle and talking about it, right? I think it's a great way to do that. And then the last thing I usually ask is, what's your definition of success? Because, you know, for many people, success is... Uh, getting rich for other people is i don't know going out and playing i don't know soccer five hours a day for other people is just traveling the world for other people it's just working hard all day what's yours that's a good question i think there's a difference between professional success and personal success so i'll take the professional one first this is something that's come up for for us quite a few times because we as i said we work in a highly visible space, so people see our ads, people see our work. I know what's on the billboard, right? So because we've produced it and we've produced the hell out of it, we may have worked on this thing for six months. The Disney one is a great example the, where people play with their shadows. Now, we worked on that all the way through from idea to delivery. So I knew what was on the screen at every given point, yeah? So the success for me was just watching people do that and the joy that it brought to people. And we. We brought out the characters at the end and these kids got to hug Mickey Mouse. And, you know, this is the, there's the heartwarming moments, right? But I wasn't watching the billboard at that point. I wasn't watching the screen. I was watching people playing and having fun and the experience that we created. And that's, the, that's success. When I see people interact with our ads, I don't care about the ad. I care about the people interacting. And that's great. That, for me, that's success. It's the power of emotions, right? Absolutely. And that's the job that we do. That's why we get into, you know, that's why we get into it. I think the people that stay in this industry are there because that bit is a drug. The success is a drug. Right? Yeah. And I just want more of that. Um, on the personal side, I, I'm going to say that my, my wife is a superstar. Um, and I'm very fortunate to have, especially when I'm traveling all the time for work. Um, and raising our kids together and watching them score a goal or fall over hurt when they're playing football is success. Yeah, the, the, we're raising kids who can appreciate each other and um, my daughter plays football, my son plays football and they're, in, you know, they're part of a team. They're, they're learning all of these skills through sports and I, I just I love being part of that and that's for me is success. Dan, thank you so much for accepting the invites. That was really yeah. a great conversation. Cheers. Thanks Cheers to me. emotion and, and passion. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you, you too. It's good. It's good, right? That was a good breakfast, by the way. <laughs> <laughs>